I'm David Glasser, I'm the co-chair of the institution, the museum, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everybody here this evening. Um, we have a remarkable exhibition, and the exhibition about Joseph Herrmann's early years, the unknown years about Joseph Herrmann, uh, was a story that was waiting to be told, and for reasons which we now understand, David, weren't told because it was the most challenging and difficult story to tell because unlike his period from Wales from 1945, when he was fully recognized as a genius he was, and he had over 200 exhibitions, I think, in his lifetime, that part of his life was well recorded and well told. But the early years, the formative years, the years from 1938, when he escaped from Warsaw, and then literally went through forced journeys to, France, to Brussels, to France, to Liverpool and then of all places to my hometown Glasgow uh, and then to London before Wales is a different story and it's an unknown story and the work that you see here is also pretty much unknown. It's very difficult for scholars to make impartial critical assessments of an artist's life and career or a part of an artist's life and career. It is infinitely more difficult for a relation somebody who knows the art as well, and particularly, if I may say so, for his son, to make a critical assessment of that period <coughs> and to discuss and analyze why certain things happened uh, to a father and how that affected his art and his belief in what he was achieving. But I know that you will be absolutely enthralled this evening by David's Heron, Joseph's son's address, because it does exactly that. It gives a critical assessment from almost a completely impartial intellectual view, but of course by somebody who is neither impartial nor independent. So I don't want to say anything more except enjoy the evening, then enjoy the exhibition, and remember that that's what Benuri is about. Benuri is about bringing stories that haven't been told to the public's attention and telling them in a way that engages ever enlarging groups of people. So, David, thank you for coming back, thank and you. the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Now for the dust cart after the Lord Mayor's procession. Uh, this talk will consist of five questions and four surprises. As David said, he was very keen on calling this centenary show the unknown Joseph Herman. He rightly thought that when people think of my father Joseph, they think of his paintings from the late 40s, the 1950s and the 1960s, of coal miners, fishermen and peasants, men who worked on the ground, on the land, under the land, and at sea. Monumental paintings, men at rest against a radiant copper-red sunset at twilight. That, as David says, is the known Joseph Herman, which you can see at the Tate, at public collections all around Britain, in all the books about Joseph, and for which he was elected an RA and awarded an OBE. And this exhibition, as David said, was to mark the centenary of Joseph's birth, and it is completely different. Drawings and paintings of Jews, Joseph's family in Warsaw, Jews from Glasgow, fellow refugees, of pogroms, of Yiddish tales, of Warsaw street life, musicians, organ grinders, rabbis, scholars, images of the Jewish world of his childhood in pre-war Warsaw. And that is the unknown Joseph Herman. You won't find it in any public collections. You'll hardly see it in any of the books or television documentaries about Joseph or in any of the 200 or so exhibitions of his work over the past 60 years or in most of the books about him. So, question number one. Why did this work become unknown? Why did these drawings and paintings disappear? What happened to them? Question number two, why did he change so completely and so quickly? Why, having found this subject and this voice, did he abandon it and find a completely different voice? Question number three, which is, to be honest, really the same question, why this year, when there were two centenary exhibitions 100 years after his birth in 1911, are they so very different? How could these exhibitions look as if they were painted by two completely different men? Both terrific exhibitions, lovingly put together, 
but completely different. Question number four, which is really the same question too, what happened to him between the early 1940s when he drew and painted these pictures and the mid and late 1940s when he found a different voice as an artist in such a short time? The mathematicians among you will have worked out that there are only four questions, though I promised five. Question five will come in at the end. In my humble opinion, it's worth waiting for. Some surprises. Those are the questions I want to look at. But first, I want to add something else to the mix, some surprises. The children of artists grow up surrounded by their parents' paintings, and these become very familiar. They become almost friends, family friends. But then sometimes you get a surprise. For instance, you come across some pictures which bear no resemblance at all to the pictures you know. How could this be? Surprise number one. 1985, I go to the, an exhibition at the Benuri Gallery, then in central London, called Memory of Memories, the first show dedicated to many of the drawings here. Pen and ink drawings, wash, subjects from Jewish life. They bear absolutely no resemblance to the work I've grown up surrounded by. Where did they come from? Where have they been all these years? Surprise number two which concerns this portrait with the gentleman with the green face. In 2000, in the last days of my father's life, he spoke to me of his friends, among them the artist Yankel Adler, some of whose work is downstairs, and the Yiddish poet Itzik Munger. In these last conversations, the years fell away, and he spoke of people far away and long ago, and that's what seemed to matter at the end of his life. His family in Warsaw, Adler and Munger, and himself at Adler's funeral, three Polish Jews in a graveyard. So who is this? Who was Itzig Munga? He was a Yiddish poet who Joseph knew in Warsaw. And then in London as a refugee, in order to improve his English, Munga tried translating Shakespeare's sonnets into Yiddish. <laughs> On a late summer's night in 1943, Joseph later wrote that he came across Munger at Edgware Road tube station seeking refuge from the Blitz. Munger was hunched over his small leather suitcase which he carried with him wherever he went. It contained all his worldly possessions, i.e. his manuscripts. He sat on the escalator with a fantastically thick English-German dictionary printed in very small type. The exercise was to find a German equivalent to the English word and then to find from memory a Yiddish equivalent to the German. No one, said Munger, is as lonely as a Yiddish poet. So we move forward now to 2000. You know my picture of Munger, Joseph said. No, I said idiotically. It hangs on the back of the kitchen door, he said. I went and looked. It was this painting. But it couldn't be because it looked nothing like my father's paintings that I'd grown up with. Let me read you something that Joseph wrote about painting this painting when Munger died in 1969. Or, uh, this is what he wrote in 1969. The painting of him I did in 1940 when chance brought us once again together, but this time we fell into each other's arms in a refugee camp in Norwood, London. His clothes hung loosely from his thin body. No shirt had a small enough collar to fit round his neck. His face was green, his black and shining eyes were framed by reddened eyelids, but his characteristic nervous vitality was undiminished. The unceasing talker he was, it was a tonic to my nerves merely to listen to the purity of his Yiddish. There he talked and I painted. Nostalgia like an insatiable thirst burnt in my throat. We were both mad. The window was open and in the distance the London docks were on fire. Two words stand out from this. Nostalgia, defined by the dictionary as a yearning for the past, often in idealized form, a learned formation of a Greek compound consisting of nostos, meaning returning home, a Homeric word, and algos, meaning pain, ache. It was described as a medical condition, a form of melancholy. One way of talking about the paintings and drawings in this exhibition is to say that they are full, bursting with nostalgia, a yearning for the world of his childhood, a world that was being destroyed. The second phrase that stands out is, we were both mad. In all the literature about Jewish refugees who fled to Britain in the 1930s and 40s, before and after the Holocaust, this is one word you will never find. Never, ever. And it is the word mad. 
These sentences give a tremendous sense of the pressures Joseph was under when he made these drawings and paintings. Nostalgia, yes, but also the dark, mad side of nostalgia. When Joseph rewrote this passage in his memoir, Related Twilights, he cut those final four sentences. Perhaps he thought there was something unrestrained, maybe even hysterical about them, but these lines speak eloquently about the intensity of his memories of that summer of 1940 that nothing else in his writing or his art captures. So why cut them? Surprise number three. In 2010, two years ago, BBC Wales asked me to go to Joseph's studio in Wales to be, horrif to be interviewed for a TV documentary about Joseph. What horrified me, what I was going to say, was being interviewed by Rolf Harris, who aged 80, looked about 20 years younger than me. <laughs> I had never been to Strigginlice before in South Wales. I walked into his old studio, a converted pop factory, and there was a whole wall of these paintings. All of these paintings, except for the one of Itzik Munger. And we don't know who any of these people are, except for Munger. So there weren't just the pen and ink drawings, the memory of memories drawings. There, weren't just the, there wasn't just the Munger portrait. There were many such portraits, many such paintings, the unknown Joseph Herman. What happened to these drawings and paintings? Why did they disappear? What happened to the man who painted them? Why did he hide them away for 40 years? Surprise number four. Well, there is a fourth surprise, and it might be the most surprising of all, but we'll come to that a bit later. Joseph was born in Warsaw in 1911, where he grew up in a Yiddish-speaking working-class neighborhood. In 1938, as David said, he left for Brussels, where he spent two crucial years. In 1940, he fled to France. He managed to escape after the fall of France, thanks to an American lady called June Peaches July, and he came to Britain. By his account, he spent a short time in a refugee camp in Norwood, but then ended up in Glasgow, where he stayed for three years. And here he met up with his old friend, Yankel Adler, and downstairs is there are a number of paintings and drawings by Adler, with Benno Schotz, the sculptor, whose sculpture stands there, and Benno's wife, Millie, whose portrait is the second from the left over there. He also met up with a number of middle-class Jews who bought his paintings, the parents of Jeremy Isaacs, who bought Joseph's painting of his family, the father and uncle of David Glasser, and Jack Goldman, whose portrait He's right at the end next to Millie Schotts. That's the background. The paintings, and especially the drawings from these years in Glasgow, were very distinctive. He painted solely Jewish themes. His family, Jewish peasants and shepherds, gossiping women, storytellers, beggars, fiddlers and musicians, tailors. He illustrated from memory, because he had no books, stories by Peretz and Sholem Aleichem, and poems and uh, tales by Yiddish poets like Munger and Avram Risen. A few times the elegiac glow is disrupted by very different images, such as the pictures of pogroms downstairs. One might call the subject matter and tone Chagallesque. The Jewish world he recreated is like something out of Vishniak's photos or the fiddler on the roof, but above all it is like Chagall. We'll come back to Chagall. Boy, will we come back to Chagall. Joseph's biographer, the art critic and historian Monica Bohm Duchenne, is surely right when she says there is nothing remotely like them in the history of art in Britain. Writing about these drawings 30 years later, more than 30 years later, Joseph wrote, Today, after so many years, I look at these drawings and paintings as though they were done by someone else. But deep down, I know that they are part of me, a memory of memories. My childhood, people, theatre, stories, life, they all evoke nostalgia, and this nostalgia is the background to all my work in Glasgow in 1940 to 43. He never produced anything similar again. The Jewish subject matter of these drawings disappeared from his work. He never again depicted his family. Perhaps related to this, he never painted a proper portrait of his family with his wife and children. He did paint one such portrait, but then later cut it up into several individual paintings. I think this is related, strange, but related. Perhaps more surprising, the very existence of this work vanished almost without trace. His drawings and paintings of Jewish life, which dominated his work in Glasgow, vanished for over 40 years and were not widely available to the public until the Memory of Memories exhibition put together by Aggie Katz in the mid-1980s. No one knew about them. They had vanished without trace. Firstly, Joseph doesn't talk about them. 
or write about them. He refers to them in related twilights, it is true, in 1975, but they take up three paragraphs of his memoir. They are barely mentioned in any of the main monographs about his work from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when his reputation was at its height. Even when they are mentioned, it's in a curiously disparaging tone. In 1967, Edwin Mullins wrote in a book about Joseph, in the years before Estraginlai spent as a Polish refugee in Glasgow with Jankel Adler, he had painted fantasies built upon childhood memories and fed by nostalgia for the Warsaw in which he'd been brought up and which was then being systematically destroyed by the Nazis. During this brief and unreal period in Hermann's career, another Jewish painter in exile became his master, Chagall. The language is surprising. Fantasies. Brief and unreal. These Jewish works were hardly written about or reproduced in books. They were not bought, thirdly, by public collections. They'd been bought by private collectors, a small circle of middle-class Jews in Glasgow who supported him during his years in Glasgow. He was barely known then at all outside of Scotland. He kept many of the drawings himself, hidden away, never on the walls, but chose not to exhibit them until, 19, until 1985. There is something curious, indeed implausible, about the idea that he simply stumbled on a pile of drawings, as he said, in his studio, but that's all he said. And now we come to surprise number four. Thank you for waiting patiently. In 1944, Joseph moved to South Wales, where he produced much of his best-known work in his private journal. He wrote on the 1st of October, 1948, I was not at all sorry to part with a lot of the works I did in Glasgow. Took out for burning some pictures and stacks of drawings. A curious delight. I know exactly how I got onto this Chagallic trick, but it is no longer any interest for me. Charm cannot be a substitute for good painting, and Chagall paints poorly and at no stage painted well. With me now, painting begins with the itch for handling pigment. The greater the sense for pigments, the greater the painting. This was written nearly four years after he arrived in South Wales and had started to move towards a completely different kind of work. That doesn't, however, account for the tone. A curious delight. No one, I think, has asked before, where did this strange tone come from? Why delight? What was going on? This passage was not published in his lifetime, and I think like the edited sentences about Munger that he edited out, I think he would never have chosen to have them published. Why? Because it's so strange. And why is it so strange? I think because the feelings involved are so intense. It is partly about, one, finding a new artistic voice. Not Chagall, not Jewish, but something quite new. Two, partly about dealing with intense feelings to do with loss and loneliness. The first way was to point the world he had lost. These are the pictures in this, in this exhibition. The second is completely different. It is to find a way of creating an art about loneliness and solitude, which despite appearances is not, in my view, unrelated to the work in this exhibition. An art about loneliness and solitude which brings loneliness and solitude to life. And I'll explain what I mean by that shortly. The point is, there's a sense of suppression here. The intensity of his feelings in the summer of 1940 evoked in the passage about Munger and of his feelings in 1948 towards the Jewish work of the Glasgow period were so strong that they were lost, put away somewhere, just as the drawings were. The Jewish subject matter of the Glasgow drawings had become an impossible subject. But to put this extremely crudely, if drawing a familiar world of Polish Jewish life was impossible, what could he draw? What other subject could he find? And how should he draw it? What kind of tradition could he become part of? In other words, what kind of artist could he be? If not a Jewish artist, what? Joseph always said he found his voice as an artist in Istra Ginlice in South Wales. In his memoir, he later wrote that before he came to Wales, I was in a state of spiritual crisis as well as artistic. The nostalgia for my childhood years had burnt itself out and nothing had taken its place except a vague feeling for big forms and a cry within me for a new belief in man's serenity. Note the move. From Jews to man, man's serenity. From Jews in Poland to a universal subject. But when he came to Wales, he wrote, I felt my inner emptiness filling. Here I began working from scratch as though I had never drawn or painted before. 
Why would an artist who had produced the extraordinary work in this show write that he had never drawn or painted before? Drawn or painted differently, certainly, but never before. There is a passage which is often quoted, and which he often quoted, which captures this sense of rebirth. It describes his arrival in the South Wales mining village, which was to become his home for the next decade. It was in 1944, either a June or a July day, I can no longer remember, but I vividly recall the heat of the afternoon and how deeply I was struck by the quiet of the village around me. There was hardly a soul to be seen. In the distance, low hills like sleeping dogs, and above the hills, a copper-coloured sky. How often I later returned to the colour and mood of that sky. Its light reddened the stone walls of the cottages and the outlines of the stark trees. The railings and the cement blocks of the bridge had golden contours. Then unexpectedly, as though from nowhere, a group of miners stepped onto the bridge. For a split second, their heads appeared against the full body of the sun as against a yellow disc. The whole image was not unlike an icon depicting the saints with their halos. The magnificence of this scene overwhelmed me. This image of the miners on the bridge against that glowing sky mystified me for years with its mixture of sadness and grandeur, and it became the source of my work for years to come. The imagery is as striking as the tone. From the years of the moon in Glasgow, I don't know whether you've had time to notice, but in the easel in this painting of his family, there is a full moon. In the portrait of Munga, there is a full moon. In the portrait right to the right there, in the top left-hand corner, there is a full moon. On the bottom row, to the third from the left, there is a crescent moon. In a number of the paintings he did between 1940 and 43, 44, there are full moons or half moons. Uh, and that dark blue sky and the moon motif recurs through a number of these works. So from those images to the years of the sun in Wales with the glowing copper-coloured sky, the reddened walls, the miners like saints with their halos, it's a very different set of imagery and colours. It is ex secondly, it is an extraordinary moment of epiphany. And Joseph's memoirs, if you read them, are full of such moments of epiphany. Early on, he describes the streets of my childhood, the whole of it in a blaze of light, a tremendous sun, incredibly bright and sharply contoured, a clear circle of fire sitting above the tallest building. Later, he writes, the years of World War I did not darken our sky. The street remained bright in the sun's copper glow. In the next chapter, he describes another evening in July. I never saw such colours as those around us. My eyes danced from colour to colour, from ochres to orange yellows to gold, and in the distance, a radiance of fine rose vapours, and on the horizon, in its last glow, a huge red sun. The sky shone like burn, burnished brass. But throughout the book, he contrasts these moments of epiphany with very different images of death, hollowness, darkness and silence of chaos and violence. And it is not just that there's two sets of feelings. What happens is that there is actually a relationship, I think, in the writing between these two sets of feelings. Those moments of epiphany, these glowing suns full of life, are actually needed to ward off darker feelings as dead as ashes, to quote him. These colours, rich reds and golds, are a way, I think, of keeping alive. What he found in Wales and what dominated his best work for more than two decades is an artistic language that expresses this feeling of epiphany. What matters here is that this new artistic language, the known Hermann, as David said, is completely different from the artistic voice he found in Glasgow during the war. And several things came together in Wales to form this new artistic voice, so different from what had preceded it. Firstly, a new subject. The move was from the specific to the universal, from the local Polish Jews, so recognizable and unmistakable in the Glasgow drawings, to a universal subject, working men and women with no distinguishing features. It would be true to say, he wrote in 1946, that the minor is the walking monument to labor. In 1998, two years before he died, he was asked, you're famous for your paintings of Welsh miners, what do they represent to you? And he answered, a human presence, a general humanity. From the mid-1940s, whether he painted miners, peasants in Mexico, farm workers in Burgundy, 
They are all recognizably the same family, but no Jews, not one. So a new subject, certainly. Secondly, new colors. I keep looking anxiously over to Aggie Katz, who curated the exhibition in the mid-1980s uh, for the Benuri, just to uh, look out for in, rather, in a rather worried way for signs of disapproval. But I'm sure if she has <laughs> questions or bitter criticisms, she'll put them forward later on. Uh, a new subject and new colors. And what brings these figures to life was the radiant, glowing palette of colors against which they stand. And this, too, was completely new, completely different from what you see in the paintings and drawings here and downstairs. He spent years finding a technique that would allow him to reproduce that moment on that summer's day in 1944. Nothing in his work before Wales in this exhibition prepares us for these colors. Most of his work in Scotland was pen and ink drawings or somber blues. In Wales, he continued with pen and ink, but he also started to experiment with pastels and then oils. He discovered a new world of color for his art. One of the things I came across, incidentally, when he died in his studio, which was the most cluttered place on God's earth, was a small notebook from when he went to Paris immediately after the Second World War, which was the first time that he could go back to Paris, where he had clearly gone round the paintings in a number of modern art museums, making notes, very detailed notes, of the palettes, the, the spectrum of colours used by particular artists. At that moment in the mid-1940s, he was tremendously preoccupied, both with the actual colours painters used and the effects they used to achieve those colours. Uh, and he often spoke of his family tree, by which he meant the artists who influenced him most. And this tree had several branches. In terms of the subject, the branch it was the great 19th century and early 20th century tradition of artists who painted working men and women and made them one of the great subjects of modern art. Courbet, Millet, Van Gogh, Meunier, Kette Kollwitz, Konstantin Permaker. Secondly, the new colors, because another branch leads to those who taught him most about color, Degas, Rouault, the Flemish Expressionists, and if we think of that scene on the bridge in Istraginlais, the saints with their halos, the icon painters of Byzantium. So first of all, the pastels. As he experimented with pastels, he immersed himself in one painter in particular, and that was Degas. Degas wanted, he wrote, an exactness of texture and a richness of color that painters hitherto had got from oil paintings and thought impossible to obtain from pastels. Joseph continued, Degas prepared his papers with watercolor, gouache, even with thick but lean oil paint. These various methods gave him results no other pastel painter had achieved. It seemed to me possible to get from each color a richness in itself, independent of its neighboring colors. Thus, I used Degas' method of underpainting in a different way. For instance, for a full-blooded cadmium red, I would underpaint with a burnt sienna, and for a vermilion with a yellow. In this way, I could get from pastel a red as luminous as a flame and then from pastel to oil painting. This time, the influences were different. Rouault, Gromère, the Belgian expressionist he'd encountered in the late 1930s during his two years in Brussels, and perhaps most surprisingly, the Byzantine icon painters. In his journals, he wrote in September 1948, have recently been steered by a new passion, a love for icon painters. Their styles, their inventions are characterized by an extraordinary vigor, a surprising grandeur in the smallest works. Theirs is altogether a model of expressionistic art of all times. Their colors are often a triumph of limited schemes. With but basic reference to the phenomenal world, they succeed pretty well in establishing pathos, drama, and mortal anguish. Incidentally, English is his sixth language, approximately. Uh, he'd been in the country eight years when he wrote that. I just mentioned that in passing. The next entry in the journals, six days later, is the one where he describes how he took out for burning some pictures and stacks of drawings of the Jewish work from Glasgow. He has not just moved from the ethnic particularism of the Glasgow drawings to a new universalism of monumental labor. He has moved from one kind of painting, Chagall paints poorly, to another. Anyone visiting his studio in West London in later years had to pass down a hallway covered with the Byzantine icons he bought in the late 1940s. 
The third thing he found, a new subject, a new range of colours of palette. The third thing he found was twilight, if that doesn't sound too ridiculous. Because he found his new subject and he found the colours and techniques that enabled him to paint the sunsets and twilight skies he wanted. But why twilight? Again and again, if you look at the paintings from the late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, his monumental figures, men resting after day's work, women talking on a street corner, a mother and child, are painted against the setting sun, that glowing copper red, a deep gold. He made his name painting working men, but his best known paintings are not of men at work, but resting after the day's work is done. And this isn't simply an odd paradox. Twilight always fascinated him. It is partly the appeal of the sky's colours, but just as important is the mood and atmosphere, key words for him, the sense of introspection and contemplation. And it's the nearest we get to a sense of the interiority of these monumental, brooding figures. They don't smile, they don't express tenderness or excitement or indeed any emotion. There is a sense of weariness and exhaustion at the end of the day. But more than that, there is a sense of absorption, of withdrawing within themselves. The contrast with the Glasgow drawings here in this exhibition is revealing. The drawings here are about contact, someone telling a story, people playing music together, playing cards together, women gossiping together. There is a sense of a social world. The figures in Wales are intensely solitary, withdrawn from the world. Or rather, and this is the really strange thing, they're very solitary at the very moment when they seem most together. This sounds a bit strange. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Again from his journals, December 1950, he's on the train on the way home. Opposite me, he writes, were two couples. The younger couple near the door were kissing and hugging all the way. The old couple near the window, the old man smoking his pipe, his wife was sleeping, and when she put her hand on his shoulder, he gently removed it. I wondered which of the two was the greater love. Who could think that the lack of contact could express greater love than kissing and hugging? Good question to ask the day after Valentine's Day. <laughs> Perhaps that's the wrong question. Maybe the right question is, who could bring that lack of contact, that separateness, the interiority of two such people to life? Someone who might have understood this is Walter Benjamin. Benjamin once wrote, friendship is not the abolition of distance, it is the bringing of distance to life. Joseph brings distance to life while doing two other things simultaneously. First, he implies that distance can at the same time be an intense form of contact, even love. Second, that people are only truly themselves, truly at peace, when they are still and alone, totally absorbed in their inner lives. Twilight brings all this together. A, the colours of sunset. B, Marxist ideas of labour as the essence of man, even at the end of a working day. And C, the relationship between aloneness and togetherness, being in the world and being totally absorbed in oneself, the outer and external, monumental, massive form in space, and the internal, contemplative, calm, inaccessible. And this is the odd thing about his time in Wales. On the one hand, he found again a working class community like the one he knew from Warsaw. This sense of community was enormously important, part of that feeling of exhilaration on that summer's day in 1944. But what really mattered to him was the sense of aloneness in a community. It is often said that Joseph was a humanist. His best known work is about men at work, the bond between mothers and babies, a sense of community and solidarity created in a mining village, the classic symbol of working class solidarity. He was a humanist but not in the way that has conventionally been assumed, a mix of socialism, sentimentality, and spirituality. Rather, he was a humanist in the sense of understanding something human, but very, very uncomfortable and disturbing about people. He saw people as social, longing for community as miners in a choir or at work in the colliery, or the contact between husbands and wives, mothers with babies, but he also saw people at the same time as deeply alone, unbridgeably distant and apart. His humanism has something to do with bringing intimacy to aloneness. Only someone who had experienced and continued to experience such solitude could bring this to life. 
And I think the greatest difference between the drawings from Glasgow, the attempt to recreate the Jewish world of his childhood, and the paintings from Wales and after lies here. It is the attempt to understand and depict solitude both as a form of intense loneliness, but also as a very rich state of contemplation or intense absorption. It is the assertion of a kind of interiority by creating these monumental figures which don't show any of the conventional signs of having a psychology or any form of emotion. Those blank eyes and still mouths with no flicker of a smile or any form of emotion belong with Beckett, Giacometti, and some of his least likely contemporaries as kinds of being who are at the most human when they seem at their least human. And if you think of the studio in West London where he worked on and off for half a century, think of those Byzantine icons along the narrow hallway to his studio. Then enter the small anteroom, descend the wooden stairs and look around the huge studio at the African sculptures he collected for half a century, starting with his friend Jacob Epstein. And on the walls next to the wooden carvings with their impassive still faces and strong clear form are some of his works, including Mike, his best known a picture of a miner. Like the icons and the African figures, there is something completely unknowable about the interior of these figures. And no one, I think, has really put these together, the coal miners, the icons, and the African figures, and yet they accompanied him everywhere he moved. My guess is that what they have in common tells us something about distance, interiority, and art. A final question, question number five. And this is the most difficult, and I think the most complicated, and that's where I will finish. Looking at these wonderful drawings and paintings all around us, should we ask, is there a way in which this was not entirely a step forward, the move from here to the work in Wales and beyond? Was something lost by abandoning this Jewish work? The way he fended off that exciting early work and the memories he associated with it show how combustible it was for him. The need to burn it, to hide it away, speaks volumes. But perhaps opening himself up to that subject, to those memories, might have enriched his later work in a very exciting way. Could there have been a way back, a way which would not have led to desperate sadness and depression, to an impossible subject, but a way forward? Why did he never return to that rich subject, these extraordinary figures? A very close friend of Joseph's, the writer Gabriel Yesipovici, wrote to me after seeing this show. It was a heroic life's undertaking not to be nostalgic about what had gone, not to be lachrymose about his loss. And Gabriel continued, but I suppose there is a fine line between not being all that nostalgic and lachrymose and yet allowing the pain and horror into your system and somehow working through and working with it. This is at the centre of this exhibition, and I think this is also at the centre of the work of one or perhaps two generations of refugees, and perhaps in the discussion after, after I've finished, we can explore other artists, filmmakers, writers, of whom this is also true. Was there another way of working through and working with his sense of loss and devastation, a way of painting these memory of memories, not turning away from them, hiding them away, combining what he learned about pa colours, pastels, oils, mass, with that subject. And that's my last question, and thank you very much for bearing with me patiently. I always understood, um, having you know, chatted with him about it, that he said his English was very basic when he got to glass, or non-existent, if you like. And he discovered about his family being uh, murdered by the Nazis in Poland. And he felt he didn't know how to write a diary. And that was his diary. He did it in pictures, in his, in his memories. And I don't find it <clears throat> that strange or that amazing that he stopped it because he wanted to move on in life. Mm -hmm. And, and getting away from the horrors of the Holocaust, which after, about which he never ever talked. And so I, I don't find it that amazing, but um, the, why he burned them is, is, is one step further, obviously. Um, I also think that, <clears throat> I mean, he phoned me up 
when, before this exhibition happened, and he said, oh, yeah, God, I must tell you something. I found this box of drawings under my bed, and I never knew where they were. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's um, whether or not that was true or not, I don't know, but, but I don't see why it was. And then if, if it was true, or even if it wasn't true, there was a reason why he did not want to touch them. I mean, that is, you know, you don't have to be a psychologist to work that one out. And, uh, but, but that's how he found it. And, and this exhibition actually went to, uh, to, to Glasgow as well, which was tremendously good because it was the Glasgow years. And uh, um, the other thing is that you were saying and it's about intimacy of loneliness, which just sums up his life philosophy, I think, from various conversations. Um, but I'm not totally convinced that the years in, Wa in Wales, you know, those 10 years, didn't produce work that did <coughs> show intimacy of his subject matters, the minors and the minors, because there, there are to my mind, I've seen several works which do show affection, relationships, and so on. It's not just solid bodies performing, you know, uh, being exhausted after a day's work. That, that I, I, to my mind, I can think of several which were, and probably you'll find more in that. Really. But I found you talk tremendously interesting and moving and totally relevant. You know, really enjoyed. It's not a star I agree that it's not a stark either or in the Welsh period, because after all we're talking about nearly ten years of work. So inevitably, as with colour, as with all kinds of developments in the work, there is there are sort of shades of moving from one thing to to, to another. And I agree, of course, there are uh, aspects of the work which are tremendously intimate, which do show tremendous affection. I think the overriding impression, I mean, I think if you were to take a number of the drawings from downstairs, for example, of the scenes of Jewish life from Warsaw, pre-war Poland, uh, that sense of people together, that even when there are people together in the Welsh drawings and paintings, colliery bands, Welsh mining choirs, for example, singing together, that even then there is a sense of a partner. And the image, I think, which strikes me most from that period uh, was in a collection of reminiscences published after he died. Somebody who knew him in South Wales during that time describes, and I think you probably remember the passage, describes the celebrations on VE Day, 8th of May 1945, and the sense of tremendous celebration in the village. And this person, who would have then probably been a child or a teenager, noticed Joseph standing on the edge of the crowd, standing completely alone and apart, unable to join in the celebrations in the same, with the same degree of joy and exhilaration as everybody else. And I think that sense of being in a group of people, in a community, uh, and yet, somehow, outside, not just because he's a Polish Jew in, in South Wales, but because he would have been outside in any community that you would have put him in 1945, I think, um, is a very sort of striking image and I think says something about what he learned about people, not just himself. I think he sort of applied this to, as a sort of theory about people in general in some way. Um, that's, uh, I, I guess... That is what I, what I would say. Do you but, think, David, that's something of the artist's role, the self-appointed role of standing slightly apart from the society which you wish to capture visually so as to get that kind of recording eye as well as there's an empathy in the work but there's a sense, as with a writer, where you need to stand back to make those observations? Uh, very, very possibly. But the other thing which strikes me about that period in South Wales uh, in the 1940s and early 1950s is that, of course, he spent his time moving like a sort of yo-yo between South Wales and another completely different community, which was the community of largely Jewish refugees in London who were Yiddish-speaking. He was involved in founding the Jewish Quarterly. Uh, and there's a wonderful section of 
portraits and self-portraits downstairs, which is the most moving part for me of the entire exhibition, is that when you walk downstairs and you see at the far end self-portraits by Joseph, by Martin Bloch, who his grandson will be talking about, Peter Rossiter will be talking about next week, uh, the, uh, a sculpture by Epstein, um, a self-portrait by Bomberg, uh, drawings by Meidner. These were all people he knew intimately. And so he sort of moved between these two completely different worlds, the world of South, uh, South Wales working class mining community and this world of Jewish uh, art and Yiddish speaking uh, poets, stencil, there's this drawing of stencil downstairs as well. Uh, manga, um, and it, it was as if he was sort of a, able to sort of keep these two worlds together. What he wasn't able, in his life, what he wasn't able to do, I think, is to keep them together in his work in some way. That moment, and this is why I sort of focused, perhaps overzealously, Aggie may well be right about this, about the sort of burning of these drawings, the stacks of drawings. Um, it is that sense of just turning away from something of just feeling there is a need for a complete break. And of course, you know, this happens with writers and filmmakers and composers and other artists again and again. You know, there's that famous moment with Kafka when he writes uh, the, the, the first obviously Kafkaesque story, which can be dated to a very particular night uh, before the First World War, when suddenly Kafka becomes Kafka. And, you know, never again will he write anything that proceed like what preceded that story. So it's not that you have to have some tremendous biographical trauma to somehow change your voice as a writer or an artist. Here, I absolutely agree with, with Aggie. Um, so this does happen, and I think it's crucial to the career of so many writers, painters, composers, um, filmmakers, um, but, um, sorry, I'm moving away from your question. What made him go to Wales? I have no idea. Well, a friend had said he'd found a sort of community. A friend had recommended that he go to Istrigan Lice in South Wales. Certainly, there was something about the idea of a working class community for a socialist artist which was tremendously appealing. And he did grow up in such a working class community. His father was a shoemaker. Uh, you can see from this painting of his family uh, of six people in a small tenement flat. Um, and he, he grew up as a socialist. And so I think there was something tremendously appealing. And again, one has to remember that environment, that cultural moment of what miners represented in British life and culture, and uh, certainly on the left. In, uh, in the mid-1940s when, when he came to Wales. So I think that was certainly part of it. I don't suppose he had a great deal of money at that time, uh, so I'm sure that was somewhere where he could live very cheaply. I think through his first wife, Catriona MacLeod, uh, the, cut, the two or three drawings downstairs from the period when he went with her to the Isle of Skye and the, some of the drawings of fishermen already suggest a look for a different kind of subject uh, of working people, a different kind of, not the same kind of monumentality that he was to find in Wales, but nevertheless, you can see already a, a move from these Jewish subjects that you see all around us here and downstairs to something uh, very different. But then having found that, so I'm sorry, please. If he uh, was going away from the shtetl uh, to something totally different? Uh, well, certainly. I mean, not just the shtetl, but the city and the world of uh, Yiddish writers, uh, which he had sort of brought in his head, uh, so to speak, and which continued in the course of conversations with people like Munger and Stenzel and uh, these Yiddish poets and uh, other Jewish artists in London. So it's not as if there was a complete break in his social life. I think what's interesting, though, is the complete break, that there was a complete break in his art. And in a way, his sort of strange words, strangely intense words about Chagall, I think suggests, sort of stands for a larger change in his attitude to his own painting. Can I just say, uh, uh, <clears throat> referring to Chagall, he once mentioned to me that when he went to Paris, he looked up Chagall. And then he said, and you know, Chagall never left the shtetl. He might have lived in Paris for years, but he never left the shtetl. <laughs> So, I mean, that to me was very, very uh, important, yeah, very mm. important words. And, and he said, I said, do you mean he 
do you want to speak in French or rather speak in Yiddish? He said, no, uh, that was part of it, but in, in a different way as well. He hated parochialism. You're absolutely, I mean, in that sense, there was something tremendously positive about this move, and it's always been taken by art critics, art historians, as an entirely positive move. The sense of universalism, of reaching out, going to Mexico in order to look at the mural paintings by the Mexican socialist mural painters, you know, going to Egypt to look at the pyramids, because to him this was all one big universal family, and there's no doubt about that. And he always saw this entirely positively. I, I never, ever heard him express any regret for putting away these drawings under his under his bed. I should explain about the bed thing, by the way, uh, that uh, my parents, my mother being a sort of very uh, snobbish Berliner, uh, was absolutely appalled that my father, from his experiences of being in flight perpetually from 1938 to, uh, to when he came to Glasgow, always assumed that every home he lived in, there should be a bed in every room, because who knew when anyone would need to come and stay the night? Uh, you know, they might be Vietnam draft dodgers in later years. They might be, who knows who they might be, but they, there should always be a bed in every room. This absolutely horrified my mother. I, of course, took this for granted in the way that children growing up in a crazy, dysfunctional family always do take for granted what their parents do. And you think, well, of course you have a bed in the living room. Who doesn't have a bed in their living room? <laughs> my mother won that particular battle eventually, but I think it took about 30 or 40 years till she won that particular battle. But then he did still have a bed in his studio, and so that would be the bed that Aggie's referring to where he uh, kept these drawings. And it was, as Aggie will remember, the most cluttered place, really, that studio. You could easily imagine how, you know, you might be looking around thinking, hang on, there's all these dozens of drawings. How could they possibly be left undiscovered somewhere? But actually, in that studio, you could have found a nuclear submarine under various things. I mean, it was just... But the amazing thing about this house, and I visited many artists, and you go in the artist's house and you are surrounded by their work and nothing else. When you went to Joseph, it was filled with other artists' works. And, and that, to me, was so important. Well, that's what I meant about the family tree. You're absolutely right. That the very first thing you'd come through, you'd go through the front door, and the very first thing you would come across was a hallway and the stairs covered with drawings and paintings, Gromer, uh, Ketakolvitz, Menzel, all these people, uh, his prime possession, his pr the, the possessions he most treasured, really, were the works by other artists, which, which he collected. Uh, as much as he could. Again, to my mother's rage and fury, because she always rather had set her heart for many years on a dishwasher. Uh, and even when he sold a work and he would go off, it was rather like Jack and the Beanstalk, he'd go off to London with the express project of buying a dishwasher. And of course, he'd just pop into Cork Street and he would... It always ended very badly, I'm afraid. But he might have swapped some of his drawings for those drawings. I'm sure he did, and he also would swap them for African figures, which was his other great passion. He had a huge collection of miniature African wood carvings. Uh, it's sort of rather hard to imagine. So it's hard to swap a picture for a dishwasher? Terribly hard. Terribly hard. Sadly. <laughs> yes, perhaps John Lewis should introduce a new policy. David, sorry. <laughs> Section. Um, fantastic talk, thank you very, very much. Very revealing and touching and, and, and delightful. Um, it, it prompted just two thoughts, and I have a question which you've partly answered, but, but perhaps um, can be expanded on. One is that, one thought is that he's, he's a marvellous writer, um, and you know, his, his greatness as a painter, I think, has overshadowed uh, a sort of parallel um, talent for, for literature, and, and his writing is, is just tremendous. Uh, and the other thought is, is, I mean, manga, it's lovely that you mentioned because in the opinion of many critics who spoke languages that enabled them to make these judgments, you know, manga is up there as one of the top five or ten poets of the 20th century, bar none, in any language. Um, but the thought was, you know, and you have touched on this, that, you know, the, the art doesn't touch on the Yiddish cultural themes and the Jewish themes, but his writing for the Jewish Quarterly year after year after year, absolutely does. Uh, he writes a lot about Jewish art, about Yiddish culture, and so he was able to write about it, but evidently not to paint it. And why was that? 
<laughs> I, I don't know what it was. Uh, I, I should say, for those who don't know, that David Nazar is, is one of our most distinguished Yiddishists uh, in this country today. And uh, so, I mean, you're absolutely right about his uh, love for Yiddish. He had a huge collection of, of Yiddish books at home. Uh, and uh, people like Stenzel and, and Munger were, were close personal friends. Um, again, it's, I suppose whenever you see a split in somebody's life or in their work, between one thing and another, I think that always should alert us to some sort of issue somewhere. Uh, it, it, it's not a question of a good issue or a bad issue, just that there is an issue involved here. And I think in, in, in his case, the fact that he could certainly write passionately and very knowledgeably about uh, Jewish, uh, Yiddish literature, Jewish literature, Jewish art and artists, uh, for the Jewish Quarterly, which was a great passion of his. He was with Jacob Sontag, one of the people who helped found the magazine and was a loyal and devoted uh, contributor to it for, for many, many years. Um, and yet, uh, when it comes to his painting and drawing, that subject, there was just no overlap. So he could write with tremendous passion and evocation of, about Munger. But what I did want to say about that obituary that he wrote, the tribute he wrote to Munger when he died in 1969, it is nevertheless striking, that cut of the last few sentences, I think, because that clearly he felt embarrassed, that he felt there was something perhaps too hysterical, too unrestrained about those sentences, that he, he really was uncomfortable with uh, 29 years later. Uh, it should also be said that the subject of madness and breakdowns was far too close for comfort when he was writing that in 1969, as it would have been when, when he was thinking about that time in 1940. Uh, and so I suppose that's what I mean about that dark side of nostalgia, that you, know, you look at these drawings downstairs and you think, well, these drawings are you know, they're, they're beautiful and evocative and powerful drawings. Uh, but there is also, I think, a sense at times of how dark this subject can be. Uh, it's not that he cuts out the pogroms. There is a section downstairs in the exhibition of drawing specifically about pogroms. Uh, the painting on exhibit by Yankel Adler, uh, which he gave to Joseph, which was one of Joseph's two or three pride possessions, really, along with uh, the talith that uh, Adler gave him and a candelabra, a menorah by, uh, that Manny Katz gave him. Um, but I think the painting, The Two Orphans, which Adler painted for my father when he'd heard that his family had been killed in, in Poland, um, uh, or murdered, I should say. I've just been reading Joseph Roth's letters, and the editor, Michael, translator and editor Michael Hoffman makes a point of saying, not killed, but murdered. And I think I will stick with that and borrow his usage from here on in. Uh, I think that moment... Uh, you know, that painting meant a tremendous amount to him, and it's a magnificent piece of work by Adler. Uh, and it, there's something tremendously warm and human about one artist give, make, making this image for another artist under those circumstances, and at the same time, something tremendously dark and powerful and tragic about it as well. Did, did he ever go back to Poland? Never. He was invited back after the war uh, to to go back to communist Poland uh, in a sort of official capacity. And I think one of the best and most sensible decisions he ever made in his life was, was, was not to do so. But he absolutely would not go back to Poland, um, no, under any circumstances at any time. Are there any more questions? I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to make one comment that uh, I had the um, joy, if I may say, of just having met Joseph Herman, when he came to a, an, a, an art e exhibition in one of the art schools in West London. And uh, I first saw this man and I thought, uh, he's an extraordinary character. He stood rather like the, the, the um, ballet teacher in one of the Degas pictures, slightly leaning backwards. And I, I have a vague vision of him perhaps having a cigar in his hand. Now, I'm not sure whether that is true. <laughs> but he looked like a, a mixture between a connoisseur and a bank manager. <laughs> and and, and uh, I, was just, I was just thinking, because I happen to love Wales, and 
the, the secrecy of Wales, if I may use that term without meaning to be offensive to anybody, it's meant in the most loving way. But perhaps the uh, political shock he had pre-1938 was so extreme that it led him to seek something that he actually found in, in Wales. And I think that uh, there is a sense of, if you've ever had the opportunity uh, and strength in your arm to have shaken hands with a Welsh miner, which happened to me once, you realise that there is a tremendous conviction about what the Welsh miners used to have. And perhaps um, uh, Joseph found that in a very strange way in Wales. I think that the physicality of painting is such that you could feel that you want never to look again at these you know, pictures which were your past, whereas writing is, is a different kind of mental, uh, well obviously mental, but it, 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 it can provide a bit more of a distance perhaps from an experience or slightly change and spiritualise an experience, whereas if you look at a painting, you're confronted by the physical reality, which he knew no longer existed anyway. It was just all destroyed. So why, why carry on painting it? I can understand that easily. And why go on looking at it? It would have been too painful to look at. But, but in the mind, you could still you know, have a retrospective uh, discussion about it. And there is another word which leapt out from one of the passages I read, which I should have actually spent much more time on, uh, which was the word pigment. And, his, and one thing which develops from these very flat images to the incredibly thickly worked pigment of the, of the later oil paintings is, is a huge change. The, and the sense of texture uh, and the physicality of those uh, paintings. And when he described... Uh, I was just reading Stefan Zweig's autobiography and he describes going to Rodin's studio. And if you contrast that with Joseph's description of going to Epstein's studio, it is a completely different sense of the physicality of the artist at work. Uh, that sense of working with the clay that he evokes so well with Ep seeing Epstein at work. Uh, and the sense of the fingers and the strength and power of the man comes over tremendously tangibly. The vision that he burnt his work, work <coughs> doesn't only apply to, to the 40s, because he, even when I knew him and quite well, he had paintings and uh, sometimes went to the studio and the painting was painted all in black paint. Because he didn't like it. Well, there are two different things that happen. No, I think you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. If he wasn't, and that he may, might have had a piece in the, a painting in the studio for several years, and then it would just be blacked over completely. Uh, the other thing was, which more experienced clients always dreaded, and I dare say some of them went to you with complaints about this, was that sometimes they would bring a painting back to be just revarnished, and they would find that something else had been added or something had been taken away, and people were tremendously long-suffering about this because it's really not what you expect. And he was totally unapologetic. I mean, he, you know, yeah, yeah. said it's better. What do you want? You know. Yeah. Well, the paintings that were discovered and brought back. Did your father see them? Uh, no, not in his. He, no, not in his. Not in his lifetime, as far as I know. Uh, and he certainly never referred to them. No. And he never made any effort to reclaim them, which I suppose he could have negotiated in some way. So it was out of sight, out of mind. Really. It really. That is the sort of puzzling thing. Uh, that, that sense that, you know, well, that was then, and this is now. And clearly, you know, there was, he felt much more at home with the new work. He felt there'd been a huge advance in his work as an artist. Mm -hmm. So he would, he, you know, were he here now, he would be saying, well, what are you making so much fuss about? You know, this, this work was so much better than that work. Mm -hmm. um, and, yes. So he made no efforts to reclaim uh, that work. You said he was uh, critical of Chagall, which I found fascinating. Was that because he never left the shtetl in his mind, or was it because he didn't like his painting? I, well, I think it's both. I think 
Aggie's absolutely right. There was something, he did hate parochialism of any kind. He was the least parochial person uh, in every respect. Uh, so he hated any form of artistic parochialism. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think there was, I think, you know, clearly there was something about Chagall's art that uh, he could be very positive about Chagall at other times. I don't wish to take this quote from the journals as sort of standing for his view of Chagall once and for all. But in general, I think there were other Jewish artists that he was more interested in, I would say. Are there any other comments? Otherwise, I'd like to thank David very much for a wonderful, stimulating talk. Thank you also for repeating it. <laughs> it was so popular and oversubscribed, and I think you can, you know, tell why the first time. So we were absolutely delighted that David agreed to come back and do it all over again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.